Hello. Hello and welcome to the live stream. Uh, welcome to everybody. I think people will be joining over the next minute or two. So we'll give them a couple minutes, but I see eight people already here, which is fantastic. Uh, Laura, who's my erstwhile uh, helper, who's come in to help manage the community, she's here. So she's going to wave at me if there's a problem. Uh, but we're going to trust that everybody's where they should be. While you're coming in, would you mind just saying hello in whatever chat you're using uh, from LinkedIn or um, uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube? Uh, say hello and uh, tell me what brought you here. So uh, what security interests do you have? What things should I be covering? This is a community event, and so we should have uh, lots of interesting questions, lots of interesting ideas from you guys. So uh, please let me know uh, by sticking something in the chat to say, say hi. Uh, where are you from? What brought you here? Uh, that would be very helpful. We'll give everybody another minute to find us, and then we'll get started. All right, is everybody having a fantastic spring day? It's been absolutely beautiful here. It's still very cold. I have to walk the dog right after this. So um, I'm going to be venturing out with my hat and gloves because it's still pretty cold, but uh, absolutely beautiful. I don't know where everybody is, but uh, I hope that uh, wherever you are, it's a uh, beautiful spring. Uh, here we have Maz. Oh, hurrah, it's Maz. Excellent. So glad to hear from you again, Maz. Um, sorry we can't interact directly here, but I hope you'll come to one of the Zoom calls sometime so we can a bit more. Um, or just give me a ring. Uh, Maz says she wants to know where to focus for security things. It's so vast. Absolutely. That's the point of this session is to cover exactly those topics. Now, not everybody comments. So, um, uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're hiding out, uh, give us a bell or if you prefer to stay anonymous, that's OK, too. And of course, I should also say hi to people who are watching this on a recording afterwards, um, because we always try to make sure, and Laura is very helpful with this, make sure that that's uh, reported and, and um, uh, available to people. So as folks come in, I've seen a couple arrive. Please just uh, say hi and let me know what's your interest, what brought you here, what security items are you most interested in? Oh, it's Jay. Hello. Nice to see you. Uh, Jay, What? Uh, let us know what's your, your key security question. What were you after from this session? Uh, if you can fill us in on that, that would be great. Make sure that I talk about the right things. Uh, Laura is checking that we're on everything. I see that we've got a couple people on YouTube. Uh, Laura, give us a wave. Are, are we on LinkedIn? Have you been able to see us there? Jim's here. Jim's here on LinkedIn. There we go. We got LinkedIn. And we'll trust Facebook is there. I'm, I'm always hopeful. Um, uh, Facebook. Oh, Laura says yes. So so all good. Excellent. Well, I'm going to kick off. I think we have a critical mass here of folks with uh, topics. Uh, um, Jay and J Jim, give us a, a, a sense of what you're most interested in. And uh, I, I will start on my uh, description. Now, if you guys don't have questions along the way, this will be a short live stream. That would be OK, too, um, because the title of the live stream is the minimum. <laughs> What's the minimum you need to know? Therefore, I've tried to keep it very short, what I have. But you guys may have lots of interesting questions. Um, I should give an introduction. Who the heck am I? Why are we here? What is this? Oh, hi, Niall. Now, Niall knows everything. He can tell us. He should come and uh, and be on the stream. Uh, he actually is next week, which is what I, I want to say in the intro here. Um, this is part of the Squirrel Squadron. This is my way of giving back. This is how I um, uh, make sure that my community of uh, uh, technical and non-technical people learning together, we get together every week and we talk about interesting topics. And I had a number of questions on security. So I said, I'm going to tell you what I look for, what I think about, uh, and um, make sure that that's uh, um, interesting and available uh, to people in my community. Um, you can join the community at squirrelsquadron.com. I'll stick that here so that uh, people can see it. If you're not in it, um, you're very, very welcome. Uh, squadron.com. There we go. And I think I can put that on the screen once I do it. There we go. So that's where you would find um, more of these, more events, more activities. Uh, there's a forum where you can ask questions. Uh, I answer, but even more valuably, lots of uh, very clever people answer. If you have a security question and Niall can't answer it, um, it's it's not worth answering. I, I trust uh, you can believe that for sure. Uh, and I have lots of other folks like that who are experts in uh, in my community. Uh, and, and we tap each other and we learn a lot together. So uh, welcome to the community. Thanks for coming. And uh, I'll give you as much uh, detail as I can on this topic. Um, now, one thing I should say is uh, I'm not an expert on this topic. So I won't claim to be a, a person who's been to DEF CON and uh, decoded um, uh, ATMs and figured out how to uh, make them spit out money and, and all the other exciting things that uh, black hat security researchers do, or, or white hat, no, it's a white hat. Those are the good ones. You don't want the black hats. Now, I don't do any of that stuff. But what I do do is I uh, do, do uh, what I do do is due diligence. That doesn't come out very well. 
I do a lot of work for venture capitalists and um, companies on health checks to verify that they're doing the right things, that uh, they're, they're uh, achieving what I'm going to be talking about here, the theoretical minimum. How much do you really have to do in order to uh, have a successful uh, 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 startup or uh, established company with a, um, uh, that covers the basics on security, that does enough to be safe, uh, to be um, responsible, to do a good, to be a good corporate citizen. So that's what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to talk mainly about uh, uh, about those topics and not um, uh, esoteric bits, uh, things that are specific to particular industries. I'd love to talk about those, uh, but not something that I'm going to do here today. Um, and the other thing I will say is that we have a series of these events, and there's a really interesting one coming next week with Niall, who's uh, here on, on this call. Um, and he's actually going to be my guest on Zoom for my executive community. And we're going to be talking about compliance frameworks. So if you're interested in things like SOC 2 and ISO 27001 and HIPAA and FedRAMP, uh, I learned most of these things from, from my friend Niall. So um, uh, he can tell you about any details there. And, and so if you have questions about that, um, do ask them. But I might say, hey, you should come along or you should watch the recording or, or get the, the sketch notes um, to, to get that covered next time. But what am I going to talk about? Well, I've got about four topics. I've, I've went and thought about what are the main things that come up in these health checks and due diligence in um, issues and breaches and problems that I've seen in my 20 years as a senior tech leader uh, and uh, consultant to many different companies. And uh, I'm going to go through those. So let me summarize them first so that you have the, the, the short list uh, to get started with. I have my notes over here. That's why I'm looking over here. Um, and those are, first of all, do a pen test. This seems obvious, but do a penetration test. I can't count for you the number of companies I look at that say, we're going to get to that. We haven't quite got there yet. So I'm going to talk more about that and what kind you need. Um, vulnerability monitoring, something very commonly overlooked. It's a very simple tool, something that runs in the background for you. Um, and uh, uh, that kind of vulnerability monitoring can tell you a lot about problems without you having to do anything. Um, phishing training, so looking out for social engineering. I'll explain that if that's not something you know about. Um, but if it is, it's something that you should be training your staff in because it's actually the most common source. Not all these technical things, it's a human. Um, and then the third thing is monitoring, which is kind of not quite a security item, but it's one that often brings about um, security, uh, it gives you security information, tells you where you have a security problem. And so many companies overlook it. And uh, I'll have a few stories about that. Uh, so I'm going to look very briefly at um, uh, questions that we got in because uh, several people put them in. So uh, Jay was interested in security from a front end and SPA perspective, um, single page application. Very interesting. Um, I'll try to think about what I know there. Um, I'm going to be more worried about the human element there, that you're going to be tricking people into doing something they shouldn't. Um, so let me come back to that one, Jay. That's interesting. And of course, if others in the community have ideas about that for Jay, uh, feel free to say so. There's certainly people who know more about that on this call than I do. Uh, Vimal is asking about uh, Okta. Of course, we've got to mention that. I'll come back to that one uh, in a moment because that's a good place to start. Um, Neil is asking Security 101 for early stage, excuse me, early stage business to business multi tenant SaaS. Multi tenant is very important. I will come back to that one. And Jim asks, uh, uh, understanding the most time efficient way of knowing the most critical issues. Well, that's what I'm going to cover. So it looks like I've got a, a reasonable start here. I'm going to come back to some of these questions, um, but let me start with the first area, and that is penetration. So some people who listen to this might not know what penetration testing is, and many of you won't know the, the kind of variations that exist. Some of you will know more than me, so please feel free to make a comment, ask a question um, if I'm missing anything. But um, there are really three types that I've seen, and I have a favorite type. Um, but the basic idea is that uh, a penetration tester uh, performs some, uh, some actions, uh, tries to break into your system with your permission, and this penetration tester then gives you a nice report in which they say, uh, here are some critical issues, some high issues, some medium, and some low. Um, so the first thing to know about this is if they give you no issues at all, that means they're a bad penetration tester or they're lying or something. So something's wrong if the test is clean. Uh, because I've never, ever seen any company where there was a real test and the test came back clean. There's always something that a suitably um, clever and, and suitably motivated um, uh, hacker could do to get into your system. The goal is to get rid of the low-hanging fruit, get rid of the obvious things that a penetration test, which is mostly automated, but also involves a human doing the work and looking for things that might be wrong, 
can, can find because they're going to pretend to be the hacker who's trying to get into your system. They're going to analyze uh, what they see and they're going to give you advice about what to do. Uh, this is not ridiculously expensive. I haven't bought it for many years, but um, it's in the low thousands of pounds, um, if I remember correctly. Someone who's bought it more recently might uh, correct me if I've got that wrong. My uh, prices are, are, are not accounting for inflation, but I, I believe that's approximately correct. And um, uh, I recommend usually that if you have a security concern that you do this at least every six months. Um, if you've got a high security area, you're in finance, you're controlling a lot of money, um, you're uh, going to be targeted for one reason or another, uh, that you would do it every quarter. And um, once you, you get into a rhythm of doing this, there's not very much preparation for you. Um, the penetration testers can do their work in a, in a, um, a known environment and a time that you arrange and agree with them. And uh, once you've done that, uh, you get a nice report back and then you feed that into your product process. You say, okay, well, the criticals and the highs, we want to deal with those this quarter, the mediums, maybe sometime, the lows, never. Um, and uh, so this is uh, uh, costs you a little bit of money, takes a little bit of your team's time to um, uh, set things up, but really less and less as it becomes more of a habit and gives you uh, quite a good uh, analysis. Um, oh, great. So uh, Sanjeev is saying uh, that his company can help. Excellent. So uh, go to Sanjeev, go to within the community if you can. Uh, his com I'll give him a plug. That's uh, SRM. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to get in touch with him, uh, by all means, do that. Uh, hi, Tristan as well. And Alan, for, for glad to have you joining us. So um, uh, now I mentioned there are three types, and it's very helpful to know the difference among these. Uh, and their names actually come from electrical engineering, which is a strange source. And penetration testing and finding security holes uh, sounds like it's very different from electrical engineering. But the testing mechanism has some similarities. In particular, if I hand you a uh, box that has some electronics in it, and I say, here's, here's an input, here's an output, figure out what's going on inside the box, that's called a black box test. Um, you could imagine it being painted black so you can't see what's inside it. And you stick some things in and you see if some um, electrical current comes out and you say, aha, this must be an amplifier or something else. Um, and uh, so if you're if you're trying to reverse engineer somebody's um, machine, you're trying to take the Nintendo Switch and find uh, um, ways to, to manipulate it or do something funny with it, that would be a black box test because you don't have access to the internals normally. Um, a white box test. It's kind of strange. It really should be a clear box test. I just thought of that. I don't know why it's not called a clear box test. It's one where you can see inside. And actually, you can open the box and you can go, oh, poke around. Oh, what's in here? And how is this? And ask somebody, hey, what is this for? Why do we have this? And then a gray box test is one where there's some white box information, but you also do some black box testing as if you didn't know things. So you can kind of see, I hope, how, how this maps onto the penetration realm. So a black box penetration test is one where someone pretends to be a hacker who has no inside information. This person uh, doesn't know anyone at the company, doesn't have any uh, data, maybe not even know your company, and they just show up and they know uh, you have a website maybe, they know your IP address, they know a few things technically about how your company works, um, and, you know that it exists on the web, but they don't know anything about how your software is built. And so um, from that information, what could uh, this kind of no zero knowledge uh, hacker get in? Uh, get into? That's a very useful thing to know because you, you know what your kind of baseline vulnerability is. But the problem is that um, if they don't have access to the innards, if they don't have information about the, um, uh, the the details of what's inside your system, they can't be as clever, right? In this case, it's funny. You want, in order to be able to be protected the best, you want them to be as clever as possible in in breaking in. You want them to succeed in breaking in, uh, and uh, and so you want to give them some white box information. So I find the best kind of penetration testing, the one that gives me the most information, usually costs a little bit more. I find it's very much worth it, is the gray box, where they do some black box. They might start that way, and they say, well, look, we're going to pretend we don't know anything. We won't ask you anything. We're just going to try to break in. It's, ah, we found this vector. We can get in over here. We can use this uh, 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 connection or this tool or this uh, vulnerability. And then they say, okay, now we poked around. We didn't understand what this is for. Ah, now we understand there's one of these and one of those and one. Ah, so actually there's not only this vector, but there's also this other one. We also can get in over here because we've seen inside. And I find that that's more valuable. You get a kind of outside view and you get an inside view. So uh, my recommendation here is a penetration test um, every six months at least, um, if you have to for budget reasons every year. But I, I find that that's just too long. There's too many things that can creep in. And a um, and of the gray box type, if you possibly can. 
Uh, now, Niall has a wonderful comment here uh, with, uh, just, uh, uh, can I put that on the screen? Might be so big it'll, it'll close. No, you, can, you can't see me, I'll kind of wave over it, but I'll, I'll let you read. Um, with a lot of penetration testing, you get a perspective of possible vulnerabilities from a point in time, as the penetration testers usually don't know everything about your product. So getting back a list of findings is not always a bad thing once you review them. Always good to know these things as if you have stock answers to those questions. You can be ready if your customers also run penetration tests as part of their onboarding. Niall has done so many of these, uh, so very, very valuable. Uh, information. Thank you, Niall. Oh, he says also, it's also uh, still always a good thing to try and eliminate these from a customer confidence perspective. It's not too costly. Agreed completely. The way I tend to look at it is if I, as I was saying, if I get into a due diligence or a health check and I see a recent penetration test, I always ask for one. And if I see that um, there's a, a, a consistent good faith attempt to fix those problems, the company gets a big thumbs up from me. Your customers should do the same. They might want to run their own penetration test. If you, ideally, if you're doing these, you can just supply that to them, save the time and energy to, to do theirs. But if they do theirs, they should expect to find problems as well. It will be um, unusual for it to be a clean penetration test. It's actually a bit suspicious um, and uh, makes you feel a bit worried. Um, uh, Niall is mentioning bug bounty programs. This is a bugbear of mine. Now, I'll go into it a lot more uh, if needed. For the kinds of people who are in the, in the community, um, and, and we do have uh, some quite large organizations, um, but none of the size of uh, Google or a Facebook or somebody like that for whom a, a bug bounty is an important thing to do, um, I'm kind of skeptical of these, so I'd love to have a debate about it. Uh, Niall, that might be one we bring up next week on the Zoom call as well. Um, but I will just say briefly, maybe you don't know what a bug bounty program is. That's where you advertise on your website. Hey, if you're a hacker, a, a white hat hacker, a good hacker, somebody who likes to find problems, um, we will pay you a certain amount of money if you find a problem and report it to us instead of using it for bad, right? So um, you're, you're kind of advertising, you're outsourcing, crowdsourcing um, these uh, mechanisms for finding out about uh, uh, what's going on in your, in your website. The concern I have with that is I'd rather have control over it and there's an awful lot of rubbish out there. So um, uh, the, the likelihood of you getting really high quality uh, reports um, at the sizes most of you are, um, it is lower than I think is, is reasonable. However, somebody like Google gets attacked all the time. They're high profile. Um, they're, they're almost certainly going to benefit from it. If you are high profile in some way, then I see that a bug bounty program is very useful. Yeah, Niall's right that it's probably less expensive than a penetration test, but I'd sure rather have a penetration test. I know when it's happening. I know who's doing it. I can tell them to focus in certain areas. Just um, finds more useful to find that it's more useful to me. Uh, so, um, uh, Maz is asking, uh, and I'll uh, put that on the screen so people can see it, is pen testing still valuable if you provide a tool or piece of software that someone else would use or include in their infrastructure? I would say yes, um, but you might need a different type. So um, uh, it would seem to me that uh, if, if you are plugging into something that is um, available over the internet somehow, you probably have a, a test installation of it somehow. You have some way of, of checking it. Um, and I would sure be interested in having the penetrations try to break into the whole test bed um, and uh, paying cl close attention to your tool. Is there something somebody could do that was bad with your tool? Um, uh, 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 an example of that, actually two examples of that, um, are recent vulnerabilities. So we've had a problem in something called Log4j. That's a logging tool, um, which was used in a lot of software. And um, I sure wish somebody penetration tested that, as did a lot of people who suddenly had to upgrade that particular component very quickly uh, when this vulnerability was announced. So um, uh, it, would, it would sure be good to have somebody looking at that and um, the natural way to do it. Maz, I don't know what your, your tool does specifically, but if you could um, kind of expose it in a natural way or even get a customer, hey, would you like a free um, penetration test? But you know they'll focus on our tool in your environment. I would think that would be really valuable. Um, there might be other offerings, and I talked to penetration test um, folks. Uh, I bet um, SRM could help you, and I'm certain there are others. Um, there might be specific things that you could do with your specific tool and how it's used. Uh, Tristan's responding, uh, the cost for a gray box test scales pretty well with the money available. So uh, a, an early stage startup has less money, but also has a way simpler application to test. Very, very good point. And worth it in all stages. Excellent. Uh, Tristan, you might just check me. Have I got the right price? Am I right that it's uh, kind of low thousands these days, or has it gone up? I, I really haven't, haven't bought one in quite some time. I will tell a brief story while, uh, 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 while people add, add more questions and so on while Tristan answers. Um, uh, I was a CTO at a startup in uh, uh, e-commerce. And uh, we had a very ancient system. It had been kind of hacked together. It was, certainly was not beautiful. Excuse me. And um, 
uh, one day I came in and I said, boy, you know, what's going on in the system? And somebody said, well, <laughs> why do you all look so worried? I asked. And they said, well, well we found a, a link to pornography on the homepage. I said, that doesn't seem right. Who put a link to pornography on our homepage? Well, it turned out that someone had managed to hack in. And the interesting thing, that it was um, Maz's question that made me think of this. The interesting thing is it wasn't quite a tool, but it was something that we were using alongside our main website, which where we sold the handbags and the shoes and things, was we had a, a blog on, on WordPress. And um, th there was a way, and it was quite a convoluted way. It was, it was not something I would have thought of that was an obvious connection. But there was a way you could get into the WordPress and then manage to get um, links and other things into the, uh, the website. It was supposed to go the other way, that you could blog about the latest shoes or something and have a link back to our site. But there was a way to make it go the other way, which I hadn't realized. And so uh, that was uh, rather embarrassing. We took the website down very, very quickly as soon as we realized and, and of course, fixed the problem. But um, this is the sort of thing that can happen. You get so many complex components. Uh, and this is, again, where I would like to have a gray box penetration test. So somebody says, oh, you have WordPress. Well, let me try that. They might not have realized it. Of course, these hackers, real hackers, black hat hackers, actually realized it. OK, fantastic. And uh, Maz says, thanks, uh, that that was helpful. Good to hear. I'm going to come to other questions, too. Don't worry if you asked a question earlier. I'm going to do my very best to, to hit those as well. But I want to move on to my second area. And this is one kind of penetration test and testing is usually well known. Usually when I come in and I talk to somebody about their security, they say, oh, yeah, we're going to do one of those. So this, consider this your kick up the backside to, um, uh, to, to do one. But this is the vulnerability scanning is one that just seems to be less well known. Um, but it's uh, very, very valuable and, and um, almost zero cost to maintain. It, it, it doesn't require anything really to, to, to run it. Um, there is a, a cost of, of monitoring, which I'll come to. So the basic idea of this is that you have some software that does a static analysis of your software. It looks at the source code, looks at the tools you're using. It's not a scan, so it's not trying to break in. It's, it's looking at what's there. And um, it particularly looks at the versions of different bits of code. Um, oh, I forgot to tell, tell you the other part of the um, uh, e example of the tool. So I'll, I'll come back to that. And I'll use that one here. Um, so it'll notice that you're using, for example, Auth0. And um, uh, it'll say, ah, uh, so there's a known vulnerability or a breach or something is happening with Auth0, which is what's been happening recently with this um, uh, company called Okta. I think I'm right about that, that it's, they're Auth0, aren't they? Don't tell me if I've got that detail wrong. But um, they provide an authentication service. I think it's Auth0 they bought. And um, uh, they kind of got hacked. There's a whole debate about what happened to them. But it's the sort of thing you want to know. So um, what happens is this tool will, uh, and it's very similar for the log4j example, if you have a library incorporated in your software, there's some tool you're using, and it's in your software, it might have something that is discovered about it and you want to know about that and to address it. I used to read, um, because I, I felt I needed to monitor these things, I used to read the, um, the actual bulletins. And, and so I was using my eyes as the um, vulnerability scanner. This was a very inefficient and um, ineffective uh, scanning method. Uh, what's happened since my day doing that is um, these automated tools. Um, there are lots of them. I wrote one down over here that a client was using. Let me see if I can find it. Nope, I put it over here. Let me just uh, find it quickly. Uh, so I can tell you its name, but uh, there are many of them. I looked up briefly before this. Um, I think I found 50 of them on the OWASP uh, website. So um, I, I, I'd say they're um, pretty similar to each other. Uh, this one for a .NET client was called Security Code Scan. So um, there are many such things. Um, there, there's uh, And that one plugs into your compiler and just goes and does a static analysis and checks for uh, problems. There are lots of others that do these... Um, uh, dependency um, uh, kind of checking. So uh, uh, that's something that uh, you then have a challenge, which is uh, how do I keep track of all the reports that come in and which ones actually matter? Which one is like a log for J and you know, the whole world is going to start exploiting this and we're running into trouble? Um, uh, uh, Sanjeev, of course, uh, with his expertise in this area says uh, Nessus is one of these, fantastic. Um, so I'll stick that on the screen for anybody who's interested in, in that particular uh, area. But there are lots of these um, and I don't have a special recommendation. The problem is you do get quite a, um, a steady stream of them and you can get a bit of uh, notification fatigue. Oh yeah, there goes that thing again. There's even one of them that I've seen cause some kind of spam in your um, uh, in your uh, uh, pull request. It actually creates a little thing that would um, update your system, and it says, "Here's what you would change. Just approve this, and it'll automatically switch." Uh, the problem is you get a lot of those, and it kind of clogs up your system, and people kind of go, "Oh yeah, there's another of those from I think it was Secure Bot or something like that," and they just said, "Oh yeah, we ignore all those." 
and said, hang on, that isn't what it's for. You're supposed to pay attention. So there's some tuning that you should do to those to try to make sure that you can uh, get valuable information. You need to um, train your team in how to distinguish a good report from a bad one, but it's a heck of a lot better than reading the security reports yourself. So uh, that's a tool that uh, I have certainly seen used since my time of activity in this area, uh, and I wish I'd had it. Uh, so we've covered two of the uh, the key areas uh, that I say are the, the kind of theoretical minimum. What's the, the minimum that you have to do to, to be uh, successful? And I'm going to come to one of these questions from earlier. Um, Vimal, I think we covered central identity provider. Um, the answer is uh, no, they're not secure. And so you should be checking them. You should be watching for um, challenges with, if you're using something to do your authentication like Auth0. Yeah, you, you can get, uh, that, that's a, a, an attack vector. And using tools and um, your own monitoring to uh, to verify them is uh, unfortunately necessary if you're going to use that. Um, let's see, uh, multi-tenant SaaS. Now that's an important area. So um, we, we're covering Security 101 for early stage and, and um, B2B or B2C. You know, whoever your customers are, um, these methods are, are relevant um, for Neil's question. But uh, Neil asks specifically about multi-tenant. So if anybody doesn't know what that means, that means I have a software system and I have uh, uh, something that people can log on to and use and uh, they can get information. So you could think of Facebook as a very, very simple example. Um, Facebook has a whole bunch of servers and computers and databases, and they're all shared by everybody who uses Facebook. Um, similarly, um, YouTube, which some of you are on, you know, is going to have um, a single place where all the um, videos from everybody goes. And if I were to make this video private, that might be something that would be enforced by YouTube. But I might, if it was super private, if I were telling you my, my secrets for uh, secret plans for world domination, um, I might say, I want this to be so private that nobody could possibly get to it. Well, I might not want to store it on something that is multi tenanted, that has many users all on the same computer. I might say, I want you to give me my own special computer, YouTube. Now, YouTube wouldn't offer me that, but I could, sir, I'm sure I could get that from another video provider. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell you my secret plans for world domination. I haven't got my cat to stroke here. So uh, don't, don't worry about that. But, um, if you do have that kind of offering, um, it's super important to pay very close attention to uh, your own software checks for um, uh, separation of data. My favorite way to do that is to make sure that the data is actually stored separately. I always get the heebie-jeebies when someone says, yeah, we have all the data in the same database, but don't worry, there's just an extra column in the data, you could think of this like a spreadsheet, and I'm going to store all of your secret information, you know, the bank, your, all of your bank account details and your PIN numbers and things. Don't worry, I'm going to stick it all in the same spreadsheet, but then I'm going to have a column. And then if I want to get Jim's um, uh, uh, information and I want to get Neil's information, I'll just check that column to make sure I'm looking at Jim's information. I send that to Jim and Neil's information. I send it to Neil. The problem is it's all in the same place. So if I make just one mistake, then I might send Neil's information to Jim and both of them are not going to be very happy about that. That's a good way to get in a lot of trouble if you're multi-tenanted. So my preference there is to have some um, architectural distinction or some architectural um, barriers, such as uh, their um, the data is stored in different databases. That doesn't provide perfect um, control, um, but I'd be looking for any kind of architectural barrier you could put in place to make that safer. And yeah, um, there's more I can say about that if you if you want to know more by, by all means, any of you uh, feel free to ask. Um, Alan says uh, on the question of vulnerability scanning, uh, you can have it linked to your repository. Yes, that's what I mean. So I mean something that is um, uh, attached to your uh, uh, source control. It's actually scanning your code and the um, tools you're using in order to bring in software that uh, open source software usually uh, that uh, is assisting you like log4j. And um, uh, it's scanning for things like gems and uh, NuGet packages and Node and all the other good things. Um, where one of the problems is that uh, people can put evil stuff in one of those uh, repositories in one of those locations, and um, you want to know about that quickly. So uh, Alan makes a very good suggestion. You should be connecting it in that way. Absolutely, you should. Um, uh, so Niall says, uh, for multi-tenant, uh, you definitely want a document describing how you keep your customer data separated. Absolutely. Every one of your customers who is smart is going to ask for that. So certainly document how you do it. OK, well, let me come on to my third. And this is the most important. I'd say um, if I'm going to pick two of the, the four that I'm going to say are important, one is the, the penetration test. It's kind of table stakes. If you're not doing that, you're going to look suspicious. You're really going to miss a lot of important things. And it's not that expensive and doesn't require that much effort from you. But this next one, phishing and, and social engineering more generally, 
is the one I see across the board is the most common. It's the one that affects most of my clients when they tell me they have a breach, um, when I hear about breaches. Um, the Okta one, uh, for example, appears to be um, either an internal person who's been compromised or a social engineering breacher, or maybe both. Uh, we're not absolutely sure now. But um, uh, uh, so many of the attacks that I see go through the easy door. Uh, and there's a wonderful um, XKCD comic, which some of you will know. XKCD is this very funny web comic uh, with kind of an engineering mindset. If you want to understand your engineers, read, read a few of those. Um, but uh, the famous one here says, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to break into this super complicated password scheme and we're trying to figure out how to get to it. And we really want to know how to get this person's data. Uh, we've, we've got him here, but, um, you know, we, we can't get into his phone. We're really trying to, to, to break in. And somebody says, well, instead of, you know, spending millions of pounds on this very complicated uh, uh, cyber attack, why don't we get a, a, a $5 hammer and we'll break his kneecaps until he tells us whatever the secret is. Um, and that's the easy way, unfortunately, is uh, what can you do to compromise a human being? Because human beings, of course, have to get into your system. Otherwise, it's not very useful to human beings. Um, so uh, the, the most common thing that we see is people opening attachments that they shouldn't. They click on links they shouldn't. Um, they respond to phone calls that they shouldn't. Um, uh, there's just a huge, huge vector here. Uh, and it dwarfs pretty much everything else that I see. Um, I had a venture capitalist asking me uh, a few weeks ago, um, you know, what should we do? Um, should we invest in this company that has a very clever mechanism for analyzing uh, software vulnerabilities that um, uh, provides really good tools for uh, patching your vulnerabilities and dealing with them? And I said, you absolutely can invest in that if you want to. But the best thing that we could be doing is really addressing phishing. That's the place they, they had actually, the reason they were interested in was the, one of the, in this was one of their portfolio companies had been hacked. And I said, how did they get hacked? And they said, well, actually, you know what? Now that we think about it, it wasn't any sophisticated software. It was actually somebody opened an email that they shouldn't. And, and there's very little that you can do technically to protect against that. There are a few things. Multi-factor authentication helps. There's some um, uh, a, a few bits. You know, you can scan attachments to emails and stuff like that, um, uh, most of which just comes uh, uh, as part of your, your service these days. So, so there's some protection. Uh, but uh, a sufficiently skilled attacker who does something like phone up and say, uh, oh, yes, I'm, I'm doing a, a test on your system and I need to get your access to your admin tools. Um, you know, can you tell me the password? Many, many people will tell them uh, if they're sufficiently convincing. So um, uh, the only thing I know to do here, I would love other suggestions if people in the community know them, is uh, training and culture and repetition. Uh, so people in your company need to know that, uh, for example, if the CFO phones to say, would you please pay this invoice, they shouldn't believe it. <laughs> they should make sure that they actually see the CTO somehow, CFO somehow. They should um, cross-check with the CEO, something like that, particularly if they get an email. You know, there's there's nothing that verifies it really is from the person it seems to be from. And um, there are lots of people who have uh, paid invoices they oughtn't. Uh, or paid uh, you know, to a bank account they oughtn't just from this kind of attack. And th there's very little we can do in software to address that. Oh, and Tiago says he's got the uh, comic, but I don't see it. So um, uh, Tiago, if you can just post the link to it, that might be helpful. Maybe it's, it's not going to come through. I don't know. But if you type in XKCD and hammer, um, I think you will find this, <laughs> this very funny comic very quickly. Um, uh, Maz asks, uh, very apropos to this uh, topic, is there a pen test equivalent for social engineering, like a dry run of somebody trying to compromise a company? Yes, there is. And there's a wonderful um, link for this. Now, I didn't think to look it up beforehand. Um, somebody very enterprising might be able to find this. If you're on YouTube, don't leave. You stay on for the rest. But um, you, you might have a poke around YouTube for this. There's a wonderful example. There's this very, very funny story. It takes about 10 minutes to tell of a person who was... Um, uh, um, uh, and engaged to do penetration testing on a bank. And uh, it was in Israel um, for whatever. I'm not sure whether the Israelis were more interested in this, but uh, however it was drawn up, it, it said, we want you to assess the physical security of the bank as well. And so the person said, well, you know, we've kind of poked at the website for a while and we found a bunch of stuff. That's really good. You know what we could do is we could go rob the bank. And they said, what? He said, well, actually, look here. It says that we can actually go and, and physically test the security. Well, I think we should walk into the bank and we shouldn't bring any guns or anything. That might be dangerous. Um, but we should go in and, and we should uh, tell them that we're there to rob the bank and that we'd like um, access to the vault and things like that. And we should see what happens. 
And so they, they donned masks or something and they went in. The story is much funnier than I can tell it. Um, and they uh, essentially tried to socially engineer in person at the bank saying, you know, we, we want to get in. And, and they tell the story first sending somebody around the back to just try to go into the vault and they were able to go in. Nobody stopped them. And then they came back out and said, well, now we'd like to rob the bank. Can we go into the vault? And they said, OK, you can go in. Uh, very funny story. See if you can find it. If uh, if you can't ask me later, but um, absolutely, um, Maz. That, that, although I doubt people are going to show up and try to rob you, that that's probably not what you're what you're looking for. There absolutely are people who will do this kind of penetration testing. Um, ask a penetration tester if you have trouble finding one. Ask me. Ask uh, Sanjeev. I'm, I'm sure he'd be happy to help um, point you in the direction of folks who can do this. Um, but they absolutely will do that kind of testing, and I think that would be really useful, especially if you're highly exposed. If you're dealing with lots of money or um, um, people's uh, super private information. You know, one um, group in the community um, is uh, uh, dealing with uh, um, queer dating. So they're helping people find um, people of all different genders and, and persuasions and so on um, to, to find people to date. That's very private information, right? So um, it's exactly the sort of thing that you know, a, a, a jilted lover or somebody like that might try to get into or to use in some nefarious way. So um, for them, for example, I would think that uh, this sort of thing would be extremely helpful. So wonderful question, Mess. Thank you for asking. Uh, very, very helpful. Good stuff. Um, so I've covered three now. I've got pen test, vulnerability monitoring, and phishing. Um, and so I'm going to come to the final one, which kind of isn't security. So you're getting an extra bonus here. Um, it's both security and everything else. And that's monitoring. So um, again, I'm looking for things that are the minimum, that require the minimum effort for you, that are not um, uh, putting a lot of burden on you, but that people somehow seem to overlook. And I see this over and over again in my uh, due diligence and health checks. And when I go into a, a new client, I will come in and say, all right, so fine. What's your what's your monitoring plan? What do you do to, to detect errors and problems and messages that are coming through? And often the answer is a blank look. And they say, you know, we do look in the logs occasionally, but, uh, you know, we, we don't really have a way to know. And I say, well, if your website was down, how would you know? Well, customers would phone us. And uh, I say, and, and what if 10% uh, of your users couldn't use their credit cards? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure someone would tell us there's a problem. And similarly, if you had a porn link on your homepage, as I did, uh, told the story earlier, uh, not by choice. I didn't put it there. Some evil hacker put it there to try to get, uh, get clicks and links and, and um, reputation. And uh, uh, how, how would I know that? In that case, I didn't know, and, and I should have known, right? There's, there, there are tools that would have helped me detect that there was uh, anomalous behavior. Um, and so uh, I'll just name one specific one, which I happen to see often, which is called Datadog. Um, there's uh, a number of other ones. Um, um, Sentry is another. Um, there's uh, the Elk stack, which is, see if I can do this right, Elasticsearch. Um, uh, Kibana, and I forget what the L is, sorry, but um, th there are some standard tools uh, which are used for this kind of monitoring. And, and it's really for everything. It's not just for any security issues. It should find things like and alert you and, and send you a text message and send you a, a carrier pigeon. I don't know, send you something, shine a light in the sky saying, look out, you have a problem here. Um, uh, and, and that can be for any type of problem. But it is not uncommon that the, an early signal of somebody trying to break into your system, of you having a vulnerability of there being a problem, is something that's kind of hiding in your log file. And then when you go to do the postmortem, you say, ah, if only we'd been monitoring that. If only we'd been watching for that. So, um, uh, oh, and uh, Alan has uh, given us a link here, which I'll uh, bring up for anybody who's interested. Um, I'm not sure if this is the bank uh, bank robbery story or a different one. There are a number of these uh, on these uh, kind of social engineering um, tools and methods. But um, uh, um, the, the point of the monitoring is it's going to help you in many different areas, and you can just plug it in. Now, it does produce, it's a lot, it's similar to the vulnerability uh, scanning, but e even more so, it'll produce a lot of output. And I know a lot of teams that uh, hook up Sentry, and they say, oh, I'm going to have Sentry, and it's going to tell me all the errors, and it'll be so wonderful, and now I have a million errors. Oh boy, I think I'll go have lunch, and you know maybe I'll build a new feature. And they kind of try not to look at the at the errors. That's not the most helpful thing. You want to filter these very carefully and pay attention to them. But once you get something intelligent set up, and you have a mechanism of being alerted, you're going to be alerted to all kinds of interesting things, and those are valuable. Oh, uh, Niall found the uh, the bank robbery story. There we go. So um, fantastic. So uh, enjoy that. Don't go watch it now. Stick around. We got another uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so, but I um, uh, hope you'll enjoy that. Uh, uh, I certainly did. I'm going to go back and watch it now that uh, Maz has reminded me about it. Very helpful. Um, 
uh ah jim jim and sanji for reminding me the l and elk is log stash of course so um th there's a mechanism for kind of getting a lot of logs and um uh, filtering them and, and searching them in an efficient way so um let me put up my uh my key four areas um and that's uh so this is the theoretical minimum according to squirrel you know you could certainly have your own theoretical minimum i'd be interested but if you did all four of these things i think well, you certainly pass a due diligence test from me that's for sure uh vulnerability can I type that quickly? Monitoring, phishing, uh, training, uh, and all kinds of social engineering, tricking people into doing stuff they shouldn't. Um, and as, as Maz noted, uh, not only uh, training, but monitoring. And then um, uh, log uh, monitoring. So making sure you get alerted, uh, monitoring and alerting, right? You want to make sure you know about uh, what's happening. So if I put that in and then I stick that on the screen, those that's my theoretical minimum. And I'd be happy to hear other views and, and to add to it or to subtract from it if you think some of that's not useful. But let me come back to some of these questions because we got really good questions at the beginning. I really appreciate those. Uh, let's see. So we had um, covered central identity provider. Ah, front end and SPA. Now that's a fun puzzle. And I haven't thought about that one very much. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you on the fly what I've seen people do in that area. But this is evolving, right? And mobile security is uh, uh, super challenging because you have so little control, uh, right? The, you're really at the mercy of uh, whoever's making the phone. And uh, when they have the vulnerability, you certainly want to know about so the first thing I'd really double down on there is um, vulnerability monitoring, um, the things that are tied to my repository that are telling me quickly um, whether there's something in the base um, operating system of the phone, for example, that's a vulnerability that I need to watch out for. I'm making a certain system call. I'm, I'm asking the phone to do something for me. And when I do that in this particular way, um, that gives a vector for someone to, to do something evil um, uh, uh, to, to my uh, application. That would be one I'd be worried about. Um, and then the other one, now this is a very important area, uh, important acronym to know. Uh, I don't think I'm going to know what this acronym stands for, so I'll leave that to other folks. Um, but that is OWASP, and there's um, a, a list of 10. I think they update them periodically, so I think that's kind of the top 10 uh, sorts of things that go wrong in web pages, and they certainly um, are uh, uh, particularly uh, aware of and, and focused on um, the kind of more modern tricks like single page applications where uh, you, you, all the stuff happens on the page. You're not um, reloading the page and going from one uh, web address URL to another. Um, and uh, if you can follow all of the uh, and pass all of the OWASP, o OWASP um, checks, you're usually in pretty good shape. So I'd say that would be a, a, an addition to the minimum uh, maybe uh, for, for you. Um, sorry, I forgot who asked that. I'll, I'll find it again. Um, that was Neil, was it, uh, who was asking about that? Uh, yes, it was, uh, no, it was uh, Vimal, of course. Um, so uh, Vimal, I might add for you um, uh, some checks uh, and training for your team on the OWASP um, uh, 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 vulnerabilities, the OWASP errors, common mistakes. Um, and if, if you're not sure what these are, go have a look. But there are things like cross-site scripting ways of uh, kind of stealing information from um, one site using information on another that is uh, vulnerable um, and uh, uh, tricks of that kind. Um, they're usually pretty simple things that you can do about it. Your penetration test should find most of these. But um, if you have a particular concern about it, I would train your team in this uh, in these uh, methods. I think there are also monitoring tools that will specifically automatically check for some of these, and, and those would be worth doing. Good penetration testers use automation as well to help them find problems. So um, I hope that's helpful. Uh, them all feel free to ask more about that if you would like to. Uh, let's see what other great questions we had. Um, so I had the feeling there was one more that I wanted to go back and find. Let me look. Maybe not. Uh, no, I don't see another question at the moment. Great. Uh, so if you have another question, I've missed it. Feel free to throw it back in. Uh, here's one from Maz again. Would threat modeling training be worth investing in at all? Or is that after you've got the basics down to help have security mindsets baked into development? Very, very good question. So what I've omitted here, um, mainly, although I did just touch on it a moment ago for, for training for um, OWASP um, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, I've kind of omitted training for your team. And that was intentional. Not because I don't think it's absolutely brilliant. So you absolutely should um, do that if you possibly can. 
um, the security training I've received has been very valuable and has helped me to, to know about the uh, important issues and to, to be the amateur that I am at, uh, at this, but to be uh, good enough to, uh, to help companies to identify where they need um, greater experts. So um, uh, that's certainly a very, very useful thing to do, and I'm uh, keen for all kinds of security training. Um, I didn't put it in the theoretical minimum because I was trying to get the, the minimum effort items. What are the things you can do that, as Maz says, are the basics? What can you do with kind of not thinking? And you should be able to just hire someone to do a penetration test, um, put in place a vulnerability monitor, um, train people on phishing and, and how, you know, test them and make sure they're not uh, vulnerable to it, and put in place monitoring. Uh, you know, almost without thinking. These are standard tools. They're uh, readily available and you don't have to work very hard. Security training is going to take a bunch of time from your team. It's certainly going to give them a very good cultural message um, and it's going to help them to identify problems and avoid the other things catching their problems. So it'll be more efficient. Um, but I don't find that it's really the minimum. Doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Um, so, and, and Maz is asking specifically about threat modeling. So um, finding about what sorts of things might go wrong. How, how do I think like a hacker? and identify what threats there are to my application. Very valuable. Uh, I think there are lots of different types of security training, probably more than I know, but uh, and that sounds like a very useful one. Um, but I get, as, as Maz says, I, I think I'd get the basics first. Make sure you get the four uh, minimums in place, and that gives you the safety net to then do more. Hope that's helpful to Maz. Super. Um, I'm looking for any other questions. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a, a few moments uh, to, to fire in additional questions if you have them. I don't think I, I see any more. Uh, so I'm just going to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, say thank you for coming. Uh, there is a further Zoom call next week, so go to squirrelsquadron.com if you're interested um, in coming to that. That one's particularly related to this and has Niall, who's been on here helping us. Um, so uh, if you'd like to go to that, that is squirrelsquadron.com. So uh, have a look there. Uh, you can sign up for uh, events on compliance, which is next week. Um, we have a couple on um, uh, uh, cadence, getting releases out quickly. Uh, then we have a uh, live event in early May in London. I hope to get to other cities soon, but uh, right now I'm focusing on London. Uh, that's the 5th of May, and it's on helping your tech team to be more bold. So uh, I'd love to see you with those. I'd love to see you on the Squirrel Squadron for forum, asking questions, having a debate. Uh, we just had a fascinating discussion, um, uh, one on... Um, uh, a couple of ones. Uh, we had one on uh, being blackmailed for salary. So uh, what do you do when someone says, I, I'm going to walk out the door before the big delivery unless you pay me a lot more right now? Uh, that was a fun topic. And uh, we had another that was just coming up on, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's gone out of my head what it was, but there, there have been some really fascinating ones and uh, hope to see you there uh, to have that kind of discussion. I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to stop there, uh, give you back the, the balance of the time. But uh, thank you so much for coming, for all your interesting questions and contributions, and uh, love to see you at future events. Thanks so much, everybody.